Speaker is a senior philosophy major in the College of Arts and Sciences with a double minor in theology and Italian. Uh, she is currently developing an honors thesis on the topic of her talk as she continues exploring her passion for bioethics. Please welcome Alessandra Greco. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And as previously stated, I will be discussing the complexities of pediatric bioethics. There we go. Before I begin this discussion, I would first like to sketch an overarching framework in which I will address the problem. First, I will provide a definition of what it means to actually be a seriously ill newborn. Then, I will take these newborns and place them within our current healthcare system and draw upon several philosophical tools to address the problem at hand. Some of which include the role of the family as an institution, an infant's social and personal quality of life, and indicators of humanhood. So what exactly does it mean to be a seriously ill newborn? These are newborns that have an extremely slim chance of survival. We're talking on average between a few days after birth to a few weeks. These include infants with anencephaly, or they only have a brain stem, fetal cardiac abnormalities, such as hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and bone diseases such as osteogenesis imperfecta, where an infant's bones are as fragile as paper. Interestingly enough, these newborns are also called neonates because they are less than four weeks old. Now, although they are extremely rare, the, cost, the healthcare costs of these infants are five times as great. On average, they can span from $250,000 to $2.5 million. Now, this begs the question, who pays that cost? And with that, we turn to our healthcare system. Our healthcare system is a disgustingly lucrative market. In 2016 alone, national healthcare expenditures grew 5.7% and reached a whopping $3.35 trillion. That's 18% of our gross domestic product. Now, some of the reasons for this healthcare cost increase are the aging population and the involvement of big pharmaceutical companies. Interestingly enough, neonatal intensive care units, or NICUs, have become profit centers within hospitals. This is due to their moral ambiguities and their idiosyncrasies as far as te innovative technology. Some people think that these infants seem like robots, which is very interesting. Now, the bigger question is, within our healthcare framework, there are two polarizing justice frameworks that emerge. Americans would like to give treatment to those who cannot afford it, but unfortunately, we cannot give this treatment to everyone. This is due to the fact that our resources are limited. So who pays this $250,000? The cost can either be allocated in one of two ways. Either the parents have insurance, in which the private insurer covers most of the expense. Any out-of-pocket expense will be paid by the parents or absorbed as a loss through the hospital. The hospital compensates for this loss by increasing health care charges within the hospital itself. On another note, the parents can either be uninsured, in which Medicaid covers the cost, and any remaining amount is absorbed as the hospital because the hospital compensates for this loss as well. Either way, our taxpaying dollars cover the expense. The question, therefore, is not whether we can pay these medical bills, but on what basis can we justify this cost? And with that, I will turn to several philosophical tools to answer this question. As we approach pediatric bioethics, there are three foundational principles that we must remember. The first of which is beneficence, or the practice of doing no harm. This is famously stated in the Hippocratic Oath. The second of which is justice, or the moral obligation to act fairly when competing claims arise. And lastly, there is autonomy, the ability of a rational agent to exercise their decision-making capacities. This is also known as respect for persons. In the famous words of John Stuart Mill, over his body, the individual is sovereign. What's so fascinating about pediatric bioethics is it flips these foundational principles on its head. Now this is due to the fact that these infants lack decision-making capacities. 
The traditional dichotomous relationship between a patient and a doctor is thus expanded to encompass a third party, the child. This marks a triadic relationship between the diseased child, the doctor, and the parents. While a terminally ill patient is able to voice their opinions through a living will, newborns are unable to do this. Someone is therefore needed to act in their best interests. Consequently, the foundational principle in pediatric bioethics is to act in the child's best interest. But what exactly does that mean? And whose interests should be taken into consideration? It's important to note that a child's interests are not only self-regarding. Newborns are a part of a family. Nevertheless, the, the role of the family must be acknowledged. The family is an institution in its own right. It seeks to transmit its own values, even if other individuals look down upon those values. Decision factors will therefore vary between parents. It might seem personally perfectly reasonable to raise a child with osteogenesis imperfecta and risk fracturing thousands of its bones every time you pick up this child. Or some parents might think this is absolutely absurd. On a thirdly related note, some parents might withdraw treatment on the basis that this neonate would devote too much attention away from their other children. Nevertheless, we must keep the respect for the digni dignity of persons within this framework. As we continue on this notion of relationality, we can further subdivide what is in the child's best interest into what theologian Charles Camosi calls the SQOL, social quality of life, and PQOL, personal quality of life. An infant's social quality of life can be defined as a patient's satisfaction with the social elements of their lives, or indicators of personhood. Camosi claims that because persons were created in the likeness and image of God to be relational beings, they must therefore consider the impact of their treatment on others. This includes the implementation of these costly treatments. Hence, within Camosi's framework, he encompasses the famous philosophical framework of utilitarianism. Do that which promotes the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people. Mathematically speaking, Camosi's model can be defined as ca through calculating the chance of survival times the length of survival divided by the short and long-term costs. In order to better understand the implementation of this model, I will now give two examples, one of a child with a weak social quality of life and two, one, with a ch one child with a strong social quality of life. Let us first meet baby P. At birth, baby P has been diagnosed with anencephaly. He only has a brain stem. Soon after his birth, the physician has informed the parents that it is most likely the case in a few days that this child will die. Despite the odds, baby P has been alive for two months now and his health care costs are skyrocketing. The parents have conflicting views on whether to continue treatment and there have been financial hardships. The family has mortgaged the house and the other children in the family are asking if they could see baby P. Now, if we were to calculate baby P's social quality of life, it would be as illustrated below. He would have an extremely weak social quality of life because the financial troubles and fraying relationships are incredibly great. On the contrast, let us look at a baby with a strong social quality of life. Let's meet baby N. At 23 weeks, baby N has hypoplastic left heart syndrome. What that means is she'll need several complicated surgeries and several months stay within the NICU. There is a mutual agreement from the parents to continue treatment. This was made on the basis that baby N is cognitively fully developed. Now, what's interesting to note is that the parents are basing their decision on this baby's cognitive capacities. It could be argued that in society, she has more to contribute than baby P. Furthermore, if we were to calculate baby P's, a uh, baby N's, excuse me, social quality of life, it would be as below, shown below. 
Baby N's financial troubles and fraying relationships are much less than baby P's. Consequently, baby N has a higher social quality of life. Now within Camosi's model, there are several devastating critiques. One of the most powerful is does it make sense to say that an infant is benefited by considering the benefits of others in society? Nevertheless, we need to consider an infant's personal quality of life. In response to this, Camosi has said that we must withdraw treatment from infants who cannot possibly benefit. Within this, Camosi notes that these are infants with anencephaly, chromosomal disorders such as trisomy 18, or bone diseases such as osteogenesis imperfecta. Now the problem with this statement is in each case there have been prolonged survival rates. So to say that these infants cannot possibly benefit is inaccurate. So we need to consider an infant's personal quality of life. Because to not do so would treat an infant as a mere means to a societal end. We must consider their cognitive capacities, their ability to walk, speak, and their ability to live a meaningful life. An infant's moral status should simply not be reduced to their intelligence level. This begs the grave question, are these neonates even persons? In response to this grave philosophical question, several philosophers and theologians have put their step forward. Peter Singer, most notably, claims that infants are not self-aware, and as a result, just because someone is a member of the homo sapiens species, that does not make them human. Several theologians, such as Joseph Fletcher, have combated this. Instead, Fletcher has listed indicators of humanhood, of what it means to live a meaningful life. Some of these include self-awareness, self-control, a sense of the past and the future, and the capacity to empathize. We must consider indicators of humanhood when considering these newborns and putting them in their broader context. Medical technologies have given us the ability to do the unfathomable. We, are, we can keep infants with only a brainstem alive, but at a substantial financial and emotional cost. In order to contextualize these newborns, we must consider the role of the family as an institution, an infant's personal and social quality of life, and what it actually means to live a meaningful life. As our technology develops, we must use our foundational theological and philosophical frameworks to take these problems at hand and place them in their broader context. I wholeheartedly believe that we are up for the challenge. Thank you. Thank you.